tell me, muse, of that resourceful man who tracked far and wide when he'd sacked Troy's holy place. This is the story of the adventures of Odysseus, who fought 10 years at Troy and wandered for another 10 years before getting home again. Generations have listened to the tale of his journeys for almost 3,000 years. The book holds our interest, like many a great novel, by following its heroes through a series of dangers, struggles, escapes, obstacles, and successes to a triumphant conclusion. Monsters, gods, beautiful women, villainous men, kings, slaves, shipwrecks, battles, domestic life, and farming. All of these are included in the pages of this book. Welcome to the Great Conversation podcast. I'm your humble host, Adrian Joseph, and today I am equally honored and delighted to be joined by Professor Richard Whitaker from the University of Cape Town to discuss Homer's Odyssey. Professor Whitaker read degrees in classics at the University of the Witwatersrand, Oxford and St. Andrews. He has published extensively on Roman love poetry, oral poetry, and the influence of the classics on 20th century literature. He is Emeritus Professor of Classics at the University of Cape Town, and his locally flavored translations of Homer's Odyssey and Iliad are prescribed texts at several South African universities. Professor Whitaker, welcome to the Great Conversation podcast, and thank you for taking the time to share your expertise with us today. Thank you very much, Adrian. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Delighted to talk about the Odyssey. To our listeners or our viewers, the cover of the South African translation of the Odyssey of Hope by Professor Whitaker will be on your screens now, and the link will also be in the description where you can purchase the book through Amazon Kindle. Perhaps by way of introduction, a relatively simple question. What sort of work of literature is the Odyssey? And why would you say it's important for people in the 21st century to read something that was composed thousands of years ago? Yes, the, the Odyssey is a, an epic poem. It's attributed to Homer. Homer is simply a name to us. Uh, we don't know anything at all about him, really. An epic is essentially a poem dealing with a historical or legendary subject. Its characters are heroes and gods. Epics in the ancient world, at least in the world of Greece and of Rome, had certain formal characteristics. The characters speak a lot, so they're long set speeches in epic. There are repetitions, which are a sign of the oral origins of the epic. So lions and epithets, particularly phrases like cunning Odysseus or Odysseus, destroyer of towns, will be repeated a number of times in the poem. And another formal element of epic is that it, it uses similes, comparisons. We'll come across some, I'm, I'm sure, later in this discussion. As to why we should still read this epic poem nearly 3,000 years on, but under 3,000 years, poem composed a long time ago. I think you already hinted at some of the reasons in your introduction. The Odyssey Put very simply, tells an exciting story. It deals with a universal theme of absence, return, vengeance, family relationships. I mean, these are all things that people in just about any time can easily relate to. It deals with a deep love between a husband and wife, um, a son's longing for his absent father. And I think, very importantly, we should read it for its fascinating, complex, very human, central character, that is Odysseus. I should explain at this point, you might hear him referred to also as Ulysses in this discussion. Ulysses was the Roman name for him. And really the Odyssey, as has often been said, is a direct ancestor of the, the modern novel. Another reason to the, read the Odyssey is simply because it's had a massive influence on later cultures, not only European, but world cultures. So to understand quite a lot of some cultures and at least part of other cultures, some knowledge of the Odyssey is, is very useful. And many later Greek poets used Homer's themes and a lot of Greek dramas touched on Homer's stories. And a lot of popular Greek religion was affected by his portraits of the gods. Even later philosophers such as Plato, who would question the influence of Homer, were always working in some relationship to him. So you've also mentioned there the tremendous influence that the Odyssey has had on subsequent literature. So I was wondering if you could give the listeners just a very brief statement or comment on the influence of the Odyssey on later art and literature. 
Um, yes, certainly. As I said, that influence is overwhelmingly large. The Odyssey, certainly, if not the Odyssey itself, stories about Odysseus, which came from a slightly different source, were very important in later Greek tragedy. If we move to the Roman period, the Odyssey had a huge influence on the national epic of Rome, Virgil's Aeneid, which tells of the wanderings of the hero Aeneas from Troy to Italy, and the first half of the Aeneid. Its structure is directly based on the Odyssey. That first half of the Aeneid is often called the Odyssean part of the poem because Virgil reproduces many narrative patterns, many structures, many episodes even, which we get in the Odyssey, are reused and reworked in the Aeneid. You must remember that, of course, Greek literature more or less disappeared from Western Europe during the early Middle Ages, and any knowledge that authors had of Greek literature came to them through Latin. So people knew about Homer as a name, and they had some limited Latin translations of parts of Homeric epic, but they didn't know it directly. So Homer was a great name, so was the Odyssey. And it's you can see that, for example, in, in Dante in Dante's Inferno, where the character of Odysseus, or Ulysses, as he calls him, occurs. Dante produces an absolutely seminal, if I can, could use that word, a hugely influential version of Odysseus' Ulysses in his Canto 26, I think it is, where Ulysses speaks. And it's interesting to note that he's included among the circle of hell reserved for counsellors of fraud. So Dante sees him essentially as a counsellor of fraud, although a very attractive and bold and powerful one. But because Ulysses has never had the Christian revelation, you know, that what he tells his ship's company to do is based on a kind of misunderstanding. But the Ulysses that we get there, who urges his comrades on board ship to sail right through the known world, to go to the very limits, which they do, and they're eventually destroyed in a in a whirlpool, that became an incredibly influential version of of Ulysses for subsequent centuries. Yes, Shakespeare uses Ulysses in his play Troilus and Cressida. Jump forward a few centuries, the great English 19th century poet Alfred Lord Tennyson wrote two very well-known and very influential poems based on the Odyssey. One is The Lotus Eaters, where the poem takes the Lotus Eaters episode from the Odyssey, gives it a kind of 19th century twist, and the Lotus Eaters become representatives of a kind of navel-gazing, drugged, I should one put it, kind of withdrawn from the world point of view. The famous line, why should life all labor be, comes from the Lotus Eaters. So it kind of goes against sort of strenuous Victorian striving for moral achievement. And then its counterpart, in a, in a way its opposite, Tennyson's poem, Ulysses, which takes up Dante's version of Ulysses and presents us a figure who's now grown old. He's back in Ithaca, has come dissatisfied with his life, and he decides to set out on his last great voyage of discovery in search of knowledge, sort of gives up duty and his political role as king of Ithaca and is preparing to set off for this last great voyage into the unknown. Um, and of course, that you know, that's just in in literature. There's huge influence of the Odyssey in the visual arts, in sculpture, Roman sculpture, in Roman wall painting. We find Odyssey scenes right through, you know, Renaissance painting of the Renaissance and onwards, right up into the 20th century. Matisse did illustrations from from the Odyssey for a publication of Joyce's Ulysses, and in film too. One of my favourite Odyssey films is the Cohen brothers, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou?, which uh, is obviously a kind of a sort of ironic and humorous version of the Odyssey in the later 20th century. And finally, talking about the visual arts, one of my most beloved series of visual representations of the Odyssey come from a, a black American Harlem-based artist, Romare Bearden, who was active through the 40s, 50s, 1940s, 1950s. He produced a, a wonderful series of collages 
homages of the Odyssey, where the characters are black and the backgrounds are suggest Africa, kind of tropical Africa and North and perhaps Morocco, Algeria, uh, a North African setting as well. We get versions of Odysseus being shipwrecked and being saved by the goddess Leucothea, scenes of his homecoming, scene of his meeting with Nausicaa. What's interesting about Bearden, so these are not just illustrations. He's essentially dealing with themes that were of deep concern to black Americans, and concerns of black American life, such as exile and displacement and loss of identity, and particularly the search for a safe home. Talking about gods and some things that first-time readers might find unusual coming to the Odyssey, what role, as my second question, what role do the gods play in the Odyssey? Odysseus is a hero of adventure and triumph in the face of the greatest obstacles and danger. And there's always this extraordinary uh, or primitive tendency for fortune to become involved with human affairs in some way. And do you think that, what do you think readers should make of this involvement of the gods in in human affairs? Do you think the story would be better in some ways without these interventions by the gods? And what do we as modern readers think about these elements of fate or fortune as they are portrayed in the Odyssey? I don't think the notion of fate or fortune is something foreign to us, really. You know, we might talk about it in different ways now in the 21st century. But, you know, there's always an element in human life which just seems mysterious and inexplicable. You know, take a sort of simple example like two twins perhaps growing up in deprivation without opportunity perhaps in a violent family setting and you know one becomes a criminal makes nothing of his or her life it's kind of defeated by you know, understandably defeated by circumstances whereas the other breaks out somehow in a way and I find that sort of thing very hard to explain why does one break out and perhaps you know study get education make a success of their life I think there's, you know, one can, one does explain it, people do explain it through sociological theories or psychological theories or, you know, theories about resilience and so on. But in a sense, I think that's the kind of role that the gods play in Homer. Um, you know, modern uh, modern novels would, if they wanted to talk about a larger framework which lies outside the immediate power of the individual, you know, they would talk about psychology and sociology and economics and politics. But for the Greeks, they express that element of something that is outside of individual control through their through their use of the gods in literature. So I think that's really what the, the gods are doing in Homer. And I, I think the poem would be poorer if they weren't there. The gods, I mean, they, they obviously come into the narrative in different ways. Sometimes it's very straightforward that a god is an embodiment of the wind. Odysseus is welcomed by a river god when he lands, comes to shore in the land of Phaeacia. So gods can be simply features of the natural world. The gods are typically in Homer seen as initiating any important human action. So Telemachus going in search of his father, or Odysseus finally being able to leave the island of Calypso and set out on the boat for home. It's of course wrecked and becomes much more complicated. That's typical of the way the gods operate in Homer. There's a kind of, some people have called double motivation. So an action will be initiated by a god, but from the human individual's point of view, it's also his own or her own will, her own action. And a good example is the one I mentioned of Odysseus setting out, motivated by the gods. The minor goddess Calypso says, you must go now. She gives him a box of tools. And Odysseus, this obviously coincides with his own wish, which is to return home. So he gets these tools. But from there on, he's pretty much on his own. He has to build his own boat, cut down the trees, make the planks, make the boat, get out, get into the boat and sail off until he's wrecked by another god. And again, his own initiative has to take over and he swims for days till he reaches shore. I think uh, you know, on a sort of more abstract level, the gods are also important as helping to define what the heroes are. So the gods are clearly recreated as a sort of higher version of humanity, crucially different from human beings, crucially different from the heroes, but related to them. And their nature helps us to get a better understanding of the nature of the heroes. For instance, the the most important and fundamental difference between heroes and gods is that gods are immortal, uh, whereas heroes die, even heroes of many of whom have a parent who's a god. But heroes in Homer are always 
is strictly mortal. And we can see that whereas when the gods are among themselves and interacting with, with each other, they are essentially amoral. And that's because of their immortality. They live forever. So there's no urgency about anything they do to one another or against one another or for one another because they've kind of got an eternity to make it up. Whereas the mortality of the heroes makes their choices and what they do urgent and gives a moral, you know, a strong moral aspect to heroic action. As you've mentioned, it seems as though the gods in the Odyssey take an almost direct interest in human morality and human developments. And do you think this perhaps, could you perhaps elaborate on this insight? Do you think that the Odyssey is a story with a with a kind of moral message baked into it? Yes, I think in broad terms, the Odyssey does present us with a moral. And of course, Homer being Homer, a great artist, is by no means crudely done, but it's clearly present there in the story. And it's interesting because it's very different from the Iliad, where the gods generally don't seem very interested in human decisions, except where those human decisions somehow impinge on the prerogative of some god. And then they take a, a very intense, often destructive interest. But the fact that Homer begins the Odyssey, the first action of the Odyssey is set on the divine level with a council of the gods. And what are the gods talking about? You know, the very first words uttered in direct speech in the poem are Zeus protesting that the gods warn people not to do wrong things, but humans ignore the gods' advice and bring destruction down on themselves. And that's obviously setting up the destruction of the suitors at the end of the poem. And Zeus certainly does express that interest, a kind of larger interest in human morality, although it's expressed through particular examples. The example that he gives is he tried to warn the killer of Agamemnon when Agamemnon returned from the Trojan War back to Greece, tried to warn Aegisthus, uh, who then and killed Agamemnon not to do it. Zeus sent a divine messenger to Aegisthus, but the warning was ignored. And so Aegisthus was then killed by Agamemnon's son. And that sort of sets up the pattern of the Odyssey, where we are assured very early on that the suitors who are in Odysseus's house are doing wrong. They refuse to listen to warnings in the course of the poem, and they're destroyed at the end. And if you look at the point just after the end of the battle between Odysseus and his allies on the one hand and the suitors and their allies on the other with when the suitors have all been killed Odysseus's old nurse Eurycleia comes and shouts out with with delight rejoices over seeing these corpses in the hall the end of the the terrible suitors the enemies of the household of Odysseus and Odysseus in a sense draws the moral of all this if I can just read the lines he says to Eurycleia don't eulolate rejoice within your heart it is unholy to boast over slain men. The gods' fate and their wicked deeds destroyed them, for they failed to honor any man on earth, either good or bad, whoever came their way. So their crimes have brought a shameful death on them. So, you know, he draws the, the moral in quite an explicit way at that point. I think Homer is quite subtle about these things, though. You know, Homer is very much above and outside his narrative. And all the views of the gods, because sometimes people blame the gods for their own sufferings. Sometimes they they think the gods have one sort of intention when they have another. Odysseus expresses opinion here, but all this is done through speech. So it's always kind of centered in character, in a human character talking from a certain point of view. So in, in a sense, you never really know what Homer's view is, though one suspects because he's created the structure, he kind of sympathizes with the Zeus and Odysseus points of view. Let us now glance briefly at the manner in which the Odyssey is told. One of the first things that first-time readers will notice about the Odyssey is that it is repetitious. Situations, events, and phrases, such as the rosy-fingered dawn, are repeated again and again. Some might find these repetitions annoying and want to skip them to get on with the story, but it's important for the listeners to remember that they were helpful to an audience that had to listen to this poem being recited, sometimes over a long period of time. In this continued story, the minstrel tells his listeners what has gone on before by repeating it at convenient points in the narrative. We must also add that ancient audiences, unlike modern ones, found repetition enjoyable rather than 
and tedious. And we also know that a lot of music and a lot of religious liturgy also depends a great deal on repetition. In your translation, one of the themes that you highlight is this tradition of oral poetry in the Odyssey. And could you perhaps talk to us a bit about some of the things we need to know from the fact that the Odyssey was designed, so to speak, or composed for listeners and not for readers? In other words, it, it emerged out of a rich tradition of oral composition. Does that affect the way we as modern readers take up the text today? Yes, I think it, it certainly does. Um, if I can talk about the oral aspect of the Odyssey, this is something really that, that was not understood for a long time. You know, you tend to find in later Greece, once the oral tradition had just become a ghost of its former self, that people tended to treat the Odyssey as if it was a written work, because of course it came to them through writing. So, you know, it was natural to assume that this text in front of them was written by somebody that had, a, had an ultimate author. And certainly in the later Western tradition, people talked about Homer in very unhistorical ways. If you look at kind of Renaissance discussions of, of Homer, the, the critics of that period rather decried the way Homer told his story. They far preferred Virgil. I thought Virgil's Aeneid should be the model for epic, polished and courteous, refined kind of literature. And Homer was seen as rather crude because of his repetitions, because he didn't observe the kind of decorum that they had decided on the basis of Virgil was essential to epic. So the repetitions were annoying and tedious. And Homer has similes comparing, you know, the gathering heroes to flies swarming around a pail of milk. So neoclassical critics found that sort of thing very, very upsetting, very disturbing. And eventually, you know, more thoughtful critics in the 17th, 18th century began to realize that one had to approach Homer Homer historically. And you get the first suggestions that Homer might have been an oral poet. And there's certain um, small suggestions in ancient literature about the orality of Homer, but, but ancient writers didn't really understand what orality was. And the turning point really came in the 20th century where the scholar Milman Parry died young and his disciple and follower Albert Lord, whom I had the great privilege of meeting in the 1980s, he came to a conference that I helped to organize. Parry and Lord started studied a living oral tradition intensively in the then Yugoslavia. And they showed that these repetitions, these stylistic features that you find in Homer are, you know, typical of oral poetry. Other, many other scholars who had studied elements of oral poetry in different traditions before, but Perry went about it in a kind of scientific, very methodical way. And he showed that without a shadow of a doubt, the Iliad and the Odyssey, Homer's texts that we have come out of an oral tradition. Now, the crucial question is, well, how did they find their way into writing? I don't want to go into all the theories about that, but my own belief is that wh whoever the figure was who put them into their written form, and you know, both epics for me have got a, a unity and an individuality about them, which I can't see as having just grown by accretion through centuries. You know, I remember before I was I joined the staff at the University of Cape Town, I was at the University of Natal in Durban for a decade or more, and we, we did a reading there of the Odyssey aloud. And it's a continuous one right through the night with, with the students. And it's remarkable when you hear the poem aloud, how much of the oral elements fall into place. For example, whenever a speech ends in Homer, you know, you get some phrase like he spoke, finished speaking, and then, and every speech is introduced by a kind of formulaic line, godlike, long-suffering Odysseus spoke to them and said something like that. And of course, when you're hearing the poem, you realize exactly why uh, you get those formulaic lines, because they're like oral inverted commas. Otherwise, how would you know exactly where direct speech is beginning and where it's ending? So, you know, they, those those elements it, it immediately became apparent to me what their use was. So I think the repetitions of Homer, I think their difficulty for modern readers, I, I don't know, I'm so used to them, perhaps I'm not the right person to ask, but it seems to me it's exaggerated. I think as within the style of Milton or the style of Shakespeare or style of, of any great poet, you know, it takes you a while to get used to it, but once you get used to it, you enjoy it, you get into it, you appreciate it for what it is. And obviously as well, the transmission of culture and stories and so on through the oral tradition is also something that it's not uniquely Greek. It's also something that is characteristic of African culture as well. 
Absolutely. All right, let's move on now. Another thing we will notice about the Odyssey is the frequent digressions. Sometimes, as in Odysseus' story in books 9 through 12, these are structurally part of the main narrative. They act as sort of flashbacks in movies to show us what has taken place in the past. But sometimes these digressions uh, contribute nothing directly to the course of the narrative. And one example is the wonderful story in book 19 about how Odysseus got his scar. When Odysseus returns to his home after 20 years' absence, disguised as an old beggar, he is humiliated and insulted. One of the main recognition scenes comes when Eurycleia, his old nurse, sees an old scar that he got as a boy. Odysseus then makes Eurycleia keep silent so that he may remain incognito and as we will go on to see, safely consummate his revenge. I was wondering, Professor, if you could perhaps read for us about Odysseus' scar. Um, th this is where Odysseus is now in his own home, disguised as a beggar. His nurse Eurycleia is invited to come and wash the old beggar and as you said, she finds the scar. As the old woman's hands felt the scar, she recognized it and let go his leg. His shin struck the basin. The bronze rang out and the basin tipped, spilling water on the floor. Joy and grief seized her heart together. Her eyes swam with tears. Her strong, clear voice was choked. But she touched Odysseus' chin and said to him, Of course you're Odysseus, my child. To think I didn't know you till I'd felt my master's limb. A very, a very beautiful scene, one of the many interesting digressions within within Homer's Odysseys. These digressions have often been called retarding elements in Homer's poems, and they received much attention from famous German writers such as Goethe, who considered these digressions as an essential element in epic poetry to kind of relax the tension and keep a leisurely pace, as in contrast with something like the ongoing tension towards a point of climax in dramatic Greek tragedy. So my third question then is, do you think these retarding elements help or hinder our enjoyment of the story? Do you think the story would run more smoothly if it lacked some of these digressions or flashbacks? Or do you think detailed stories such as the one you've just read from book 19 of how Odysseus got his scar, do you think these incidents when they are rendered in rich detail, do you think they add an extra layer of depth to the main narrative? And if I might just take issue with one thing you mentioned there, and it's not, I know it's not you saying it, you're quoting Schiller and Goethe. This was a very common idea about Homer, particularly in the 19th century, often found in German scholarship. They talked about the kind of even ongoing flow of Homer's narrative, dwelling always on detail at a leisurely base. But actually, I think that's a mistake. I, I think Homer's narrative is a lot more varied than those critics give him credit for. If I could just read out two passages, two short passages quickly. You know, Homer can deal with quite a large action in a very short space of time, if he so wishes, and he can absolutely draw out a moment of tension and drama, almost like a cinematic technique of camera moving around, around and dwelling on one particular action, if it's of great importance. I mean, take these two passages. Here's one from the end of book two, where Telemachus is setting out for his sea voyage in search of his father. So we get this couple of lines. The sails filled out in the breeze, and the bright bow wave rippled loudly as the ship went flying on her way, cutting through the waves. About the black ship they bound the cables fast, then set mixing bowls, filled them to the brim, and poured out offerings to the immortal god, above all to Zeus's grey-eyed daughter. The ship drove on all night and through the dawn. So there you get the action of the ship setting off. They're on their way. They make offerings. They go all night and into the dawn. So I mean, covering nearly 12 hours in a very rapid, almost imagistic kind of way. And here's, here's another actually slightly longer passage, which dwells just on a moment. This is at the beginning of book 21, where Penelope, in a crucial moment of the action, she's going to fetch Odysseus's old bow. And because this is so important, the poet dwells on every detail of her opening the storeroom. Here's the passage. When the godlike woman, that is Penelope, reached the storeroom, she drew near the oak threshold. Carpenter had smoothed it off, trued it to the line, fitted doorposts and hung the shining doors. At once she slipped the leather rim off the handle, aimed the key and with it shot the door bolts back. As a bull bellows grazing by the flay, so the fine doors groaned as they flew open, unlocked by the key. So this is just a moment of unlocking a door. But this is the way Homer works. If he wants to create drama and emphasis, you know, signal to the audience, this 
is an important moment. He does it like this, through expanding detail, through use of similes as a bull bellows, so the fine doors groan. And sometimes you also get intervention of the gods at a point like that as well. So, yeah, I mean, I do think there is a lot more variety to Homer's narrative than has sometimes been allowed. I think the retarding elements, the delaying elements function in various ways, uh, partly to create variety within what could otherwise be quite a uniform narrative and to emphasize significance of particular episodes and objects within the book going to move on to the main characters of the Odyssey. So let's now briefly just take a look at them. Odysseus, the hero of the work, is not the usual noble character of high tragedy or storybook romance. His main traits are his craftiness and his tenacity. Time and time again, we are told that he is cunning, cautious, and suspicious. He does not even trust the gods or people who have gone out of their way to befriend him. When he gets back to Ithaca, he does not recognize the place, but he suspects the Phaeacians, who have incurred divine punishment, that is, in bringing him home, have deceived him in some way. He does not even trust Athena when she tells him that he is indeed in Ithaca, for which she reprimands him in good humor. As she says, anyone else returning home after a long absence would go straight home to his family, but Odysseus has to be crafted. At the same time, this is the character trait that has helped him survive. Athena says she was never really worried about how he would come out in the end, and we know there are various uh, events in the novel where this craftiness is shown. For example, in when he defeats the Cyclops or when he flatters Nausicaa into aiding him. And I wondered now, Professor, if you can read the words of Athena to Odysseus regarding his craftiness. Yes, um, Odysseus does have a little bit of a, an excuse for disbelieving Athena because she is in disguise. She only shows her real nature to him um, after after he's expressed the scepticism. Anyhow, what she says to him, the wonderful lines about his, his nature, Athena speaks to Odysseus. Your mind within has always been the same, so I can never leave you in misfortune because you're human, sensible and shrewd. Anyone else who wandered and returned would have longed to see his wife and son at home, but you don't even want to know of them until you've tested your own wife who just sits there in the hall shedding tears constantly as her unhappy days and nights drag on. But I never doubted. In my heart, I knew that though you lost all comrade, you'd come home. Let's talk now about the Lady Penelope. She's the main lady in this piece, and she's a bit more difficult to figure out. She tends to appear differently according to who is viewing her, such that it's not always clear what her real motivations are. So she is also, one would say, sly in a similar fashion to the way in which Odysseus is cunning. She could refuse to marry again, but she doesn't do so with regards to the suitors. And she does not think Odysseus will return, but she's also not entirely certain that he's dead. That being said, Homer portrays her as a model of the faithful, devoted wife and mother, though Telemachus at times expresses irritation and suspicion about her actions. Ultimately, Homer makes it clear that she hates the suitors and she wants her husband back. I was wondering if you could talk a bit about another parallel that you mentioned in your translation, and that is the parallel between the fate of Agamemnon, whose wife Clytemistra betrays him, and that of Odysseus. Could you please talk a bit about, um, especially when Odysseus meets the shade of Agamemnon, Agamemnon in Hades. Could you uh, maybe talk a bit about that parallel? Yes, as as you said, Penelope is presented as the kind of model of womanhood in the Odyssey from the point of view of, of the male author and his audience, someone who tends the household, who waits for her husband, is faithful to him, who resists the suitors. Yes, Homer, I mentioned that council of the gods right at the very beginning of the Odyssey, where Zeus says that the gods had tried to warn again guess this. I'll sort of talk about the parallels between the various characters within the story of Agamemnon, where Aegisthus crops up. So the parallels between that story and the Odyssey, which Homer very consciously draws out and refers to a number of times consistently right through the epic. So we get, we take the, the main two male characters, we get Agamemnon and Odysseus, both of them fought in the Trojan War, both of them eventually returned to their home. Agamemnon in Argos and Odysseus on the island of Ithaca. 
Africa. And the kind of tension that Homer builds up right through the Odyssey is, I mean, we know what the, how the story is going to end, but still, we still feel that degree of tension about how is exactly is Odysseus going to manage it? How is he going to be received? So the question is, Agamemnon, on his return home, found Aegisthus in his home, just as Odysseus finds the suitors. So the other parallel is between Aegisthus and the suitors. And this is where Penelope comes in, because just as Penelope is being wooed by the suitors, but she resists them, by contrast, parallel and contrast, Aegisthus has successfully seduced Agamemnon's wife, Clytemnestra. Is now, they're now living together as husband and wife. And when Agamemnon returns, uh, the two of them together in the later tradition, but in Homer, it's Aegisthus who takes the lead, although Clytemnestra also takes part. Aegisthus kills Agamemnon and, you know, confirms his usurpation of the kingship of Agamemnon. Of course, in the Odyssey, the suitors who are parallel to Aegisthus fail. Odysseus comes home and he destroys him and regains his wife and his kingship. But as far as Penelope is concerned, the poem often contrasts her, obviously behaves in a very different way from Clytemnestra. And you refer to the episode in the underworld where Odysseus meets Agamemnon, and Agamemnon specifically refers to his own fate and says, you must by all means not return openly to your home, you must use cunning, and you must sound out your wife. But of course, Penelope is not like Clytemnestra. And that comes up at the end of the poem again, where the final word on Penelope is said. Agamemnon in the underworld praises her in effusive terms, saying Penelope will be famous, her name will live on in epic, just like Odysseus is. But Penelope will live on because she was virtuous, she loved her husband, she supported him, not like terrible Clytemnestra, my wife, who <laughs> will uh, earn an eternal infamy for what she did. Yes, it's actually, I think it's wonderful how he, um, Agam the shade of Agamemnon at least, gives very crucial advice to Odysseus that will, in the, at the end of the epic, aid him in, in reconciling his marriage with his wife. That moment of warning about the suitors, that's the first that Odysseus hears about the suitors in the epic. So it is a crucial narrative moment. I, I should, have, of course, mention there's also a parallel of the Agamemnon and Odysseus story with the two sons. Telemachus is often told, why can't you be like Orestes, the son of Agamemnon. Aegisthus avenged his father's killing by killing the person who murdered his father, and Telemachus is urged to be like Orestes. And of course, in the end, he does help his father in that way. Let's talk now about, a bit about some of the sort of major developments in Odysseus' story or Odysseus' journey. He tells how he overcame sweet enchantresses, horrible monsters, human weakness, a journey to Hades, and a shipwreck. And these figures and events in this tale have played a long, have played a large part, sorry, in shaping human imagination. We've all heard of them, or at least read them in our childhood. And here they are presented in their uncensored fullness with all their detail. But one episode that I would like to focus on is the incident with the Cyclops, the one-eyed giant who shuts them up in the cave and eats them. Odysseus, through his cunning, succeeds in removing the, the giant's one eye and manages to escape himself and with the other surviving men. The Cyclops, amazed and furious that Odysseus has now blinded him, prays to his father Poseidon. Poseidon then hears his blinded son's prayer and he bears Odysseus a perpetual grudge thereafter. And I was wondering, Professor, if you could read from the translation about the Cyclops' prayer. He prayed to Poseidon, stretching out his hands to the starry sky. Hear me, dark-eyed Poseidon, earth encircler. If I am your son and you claim to be my father, grant that sacker of towns Odysseus not return, Laertes' son, who calls Ithaca his home. But if he's fated to see his loved ones and come back to his well-built hall and to his native land, let him return badly, all comrades lost, on a strange ship to find trouble in his home. I think that ties in neatly to my next question, which has to do with the character again of Odysseus, but specifically the heroism of his character. Do you think he is a proper hero for an epic poem? Yes, it's, um, Odysseus certainly is a different sort of hero from many of the heroes that we find in the Iliad. That, you know, if we read the Iliad or listen to it, and we're used to that kind of hero, the sort of hero that we find in the Odyssey is certainly different. 
What I mean by that is that the great heroes of the Iliad, people like Achilles, Ias, or also called Ajax, Nestor, they tend to be specialists. Achilles is the supreme attacking warrior, is indisputably the greatest kind of offensive warrior. Ajax, Ias, is indisputably the great defensive warrior at Troy. And Nestor is the finest orator, the finest speaker. Now, Odysseus is unusual in that, uh, and he has been called the untypical hero for this reason that he's an all-rounder rather than a specialist. So he is a very good warrior. He's a very good speaker. In fact, probably one of the better speakers after Nestor at Troy. He's a good leader, but he's not the best in any of these activities. So he's not a specialist in that sense. And the Odyssey shows him as a kind of everyman. He's a rounded human being with many skills. He's a fighter. He's a commander. He's an orator. He's a lover, as you alluded to. He's a craftsman. He builds his own boat from scratch. He also builds builds his own bedroom. He's a diplomat, he's a husband, he's a family man. And above all, he's a survivor. And that seems to be why we get this different kind of hero in the Odyssey, because it's an epic. It sees as a great uh, epic, heroic exploit, someone simply be able to survive in impossibly hostile circumstance. And this means that it needs a hero who's adaptable, flexible, who is ready to act in unheroic ways. I mean, a hero in the Iliad would never put up with being assaulted, kicked, starved. You know, that would be a heroic death to them. Whereas Odysseus, because he's prepared to put up with almost anything, is able to survive and ultimately achieve his end by cunning. And yet, you know, he, as you say, he's, he's by no means a moral figure in our sense. He lies, he steals, very acquisitive. He expects Penelope to be faithful to him, uh, but he spends a long time in the company of Calypso and Circe. I mean, he does have the excuse that they're goddesses. So the uh, choice is perhaps not entirely in his hands whether to have a relationship with them or not. Especially with Calypso, there is a scene where he's, a very sad scene where he's seen crying or grieving from homesickness on the rocks. And you get the sense that he goes to bed with Calypso more out of, to please her rather than any pleasure he immediately gets from itself, himself. So even if she promises him this immortality, um, he still values his wife, his home above them. Yes, yes, I think that, you know, that just emphasizes my point, what you've drawn attention to there, that Odysseus is actually offered immortality. I mean, that should be the greatest possible gift any mortal could be offered, and yet he makes the human choice. And that, that scene early on after we first encounter him in the poem is very important for showing us what an intensely human hero he is, one to whom wife and home are of supreme importance, and so so survival for that end is of supreme importance too. There is often also a very thin line between acting in a Machiavellian fashion and acting with prudence, because obviously the, the, the ancients saw prudence as the chief political virtue. And there are often a lot of situations that call not for the kind of noble, high-minded idealism of to fight till death, but there are situations that require something other than struggling in a physical manner that requires some sort of mental disposition, like for example, in the scene with, with Nausicaa, where he is naked and he has to find a way to he has to find a way to get this young adolescent girl to to assist him without without scaring her so there's a scene where he has to come across not as strong and big and 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 scary where he has to come across more we has to be more prudent about the way he goes about getting himself out of the situation. Yes. You know, what's interesting in the in the Odyssey is that we, we see a kind of development in Odysseus as well. If you look at him at the beginning of The Wanderings, he acts just like an old Iliadic hero. He takes up arms, fights against the Kikones, and it's a disaster. It's in the course of The Wanderings, you see him confronting beings like the Cyclops, you know, monsters like Scylla and Charybdis, crafty, subtle enchantresses like Circe, where, you know, old heroic qualities are useless so he has to use cunning he has to learn self-control he has to rely on the gods where he simply can't help himself and there's a very telling moment at the end of the wanderings where Circe warns him that he's going to come up against a terrible monster a Scylla who will eat his men and will appear out of nowhere and there's nothing he can do about it and Odysseus says well surely I can fight and she says no no you, you can't we'll get 
get you nowhere. And yet when Odysseus then does, is coming up to where he knows Scylla is lurking. Like an old Iliadic hero, he puts on his armor, he stands there with shield and spear, and he's absolutely helpless to do anything as his comrades are eaten and snatched out of his boat. It's a very poignant contrast between, you know, what the old Iliadic warrior wants to do and what would now help his crew. In fact, there's nothing he can do at this point. He simply has to be a passive spectator of this disaster, as he will be in his own home when he's assaulted and insulted by the suitors. Yes, he just might bide his time. Okay, let's talk now a bit about the, let's say, the second part of the Odyssey, which is usually understood as the return and revenge of Odysseus. The last half of the Odyssey, which is books 13 through 24, forms a single unit and presents a simple story when compared with the many episodes and developments of books 1 through 12. This single theme is the essence of the final 12 books of the Odyssey. And though it is presented in a more leisurely fashion, the climax is the same with it ending in the Euro slaughtering all of his enemies. There is also a final scene of reconciliation and peace when the suitors feuding kinfolk and Odysseus bury the hatchet right at the end. But as we have said, this is a leisurely story with many digressions, especially the tall tales told by Odysseus to conceal his identity. And we have in this part of the book many of the kinds of recognition scenes and lots of acts of intervention by the gods of which we spoke about a little bit earlier. So the story begins with the return of Odysseus to Ithaca Athena then transforms Odysseus into a wrinkled old man so that he may conceal his identity, explore the lay of the land, and carefully plot his revenge. He then takes refuge in the hut of his swineherd Eumaeus, who does not recognize the old beggar and offers him hospitality out of religious impulse. So before we go on to talk a little bit about the developments that that follow this, I was wondering if you could talk briefly about the theme which you have mentioned in your own translation, this idea of the response to the vulnerable stranger as a test of humanity because there is a great deal of hospitality and there is a great deal of time spent by Homer explaining all the types of etiquette associated with guest friendship and the use of hospitality as a kind of acid test of morality. Yes, I think, as you say, this practice of guest friendship where any stranger who comes to you and sort of throws himself on your hospitality must be received and the etiquette's about asking questions of their identity and then you must feed them into entertain them, give them a gift and send them off. It does operate right through the Odyssey in almost every part of the poem as a crucial way that the poet discriminates between the sympathetic and the unsympathetic, the good and the bad characters of the poem. Telemachus leaves his own chaotic household in Ithaca where the suitors disregard guests, they slaughter another people's, another person's, that is Odysseus's animals without asking, waste Mm. his substance. When Telemachus goes to Nestor in Pylos and then to Menelaus in Sparta, we get kind of perfect acts of guest friendship, which shows how civilized norms should be. And through the wandering, we see a whole varieties of ways in which Odysseus is received by cunning, subtle goddesses like Circe, try to turn him into an animal, by the Cyclops, which is a very important episode for guest friendship in the poem, because poignantly Odysseus appeals to the Cyclops by all the norms of of civilized society, respect for the gods, Zeus as the god who guarantees guest friendship. And the Cyclops says, well, no, it means nothing to me. I know nothing about that. And he takes and eats Odysseus's men. And not only that, he very explicitly parodies this practice of guest friendship that Odysseus is talking about. He says, well, I'm going to give you a, ge- a guest gift. My guest gift is that I'll eat you last of all. <laughs> and so when we get to Odysseus as the beggar, among the suitors, back in Odysseus disguised as a dirty, tattered old beggar in his own home. And he's abused physically, verbally, is assaulted by the suitors. And, you know, we've been prepared for that. We've seen what the proper norms of guest friendship should be in the reception of Telemachus. And we've seen all these hostile beings in Odysseus's wanderings. And we realize that the only real analog to the suitors in the Odyssey, that the suitors belong not in the human world, but in the kind of monstrous world of the wanderings, that they, they're they like the Cyclops. And the poet actually draws the parallel explicitly for us, because one of, the only other time that the giving of a guest gift is parodied and mocked 
mocked in the Odyssey is when one of the suitors says to the beggar Odysseus, I'm going to give you a guest gift now, and he flings an ox hoof at him. So the poet has carefully structured this pattern of guest friendship so that the Cyclops is abuse of it, if one can call it abuse because he doesn't know any better, whereas the suitors do, destructured it. So the suitors are explicitly compared to the Cyclops. Let's talk a bit about Telemachus now. As you say, Telemachus comes home from Sparta and Pylos, and the first recognition scene occurs when Telemachus goes to Eumaeus's hut immediately upon his return. Odysseus does not reveal his identity at first, but rather probes his son and questions his inaction in the face of the suitor's monstrous behavior. And then finally, with the aid of a reconfirmation affected by Athena, Odysseus appears in his own form to his son. But Telemachus, obviously, who is young, you know, would have not have known a father who has been gone 20 years, is awestruck at the sudden change and thinks that Odysseus is a god. And Professor, if you could read that exchange for us from your translation. His son, astounded, cast down his eyes, afraid it was a god, and said, addressing him with winged words, stranger, you've changed. You look different than before. You've other clothes. Your skin is not the same. You must be a god who lives in heaven. So be kind, and we shall give you crafted gifts of gold and pleasing offering. Only spare us. Then patient, godlike Odysseus answered, I'm no god. Why compare me with immortal? But your father, for whom you suffer so much pain and grief, exposed to violent men. Now, this is another one of these moments, a bit like the Calypso episode where she wants to make it Odysseus immortal. Yeah, he re- again rejects any notion that is anything other than a very human being. Odysseus then returns to his incognito form so that he may then better spy out of his own household to determine who is with him and who is against him. This revenge is prefigured by dreams and omens, and it takes place, as we've already mentioned earlier on in our discussion, on the occasion of a shooting contest staged by Penelope to decide who will win her hand. Whichever of the suitors can string the bronze bow of Odysseus and send an arrow through the handle holes of 12 axes set up in a row will win. But none of the suitors is able to accomplish this and the old beggar i.e odysseus alone succeeds odysseus then reveals his identity and then plans to wreak his revenge uh, on the suitors aided by telemachus eumaeus and another loyal servant as well as by athena who makes the suitors spears miss odysseus then in an almost indiscriminate fashion slaughters the suitors unmercifully sparing only the minstrel and the herald he also has telemachus hang 12 servant girls who have been insolent to penelope and telemachus and who have slept with the suitors the goat herd who has insulted odysseus this was earlier on and aided the suitors in the struggle is horribly mutilated and parts of his body are thrown to the dogs after these gory events the hall is then purified with fire and sulfur and a grim pretense of music and dancing is put on such that the suitors families will not know what has happened but before Odysseus deals with the kinfolk of the suitors he must first reveal his identity and return to his wife and father the recognition scene with Penelope however takes a very odd turn uncertain whether to embrace or probe him she decides to put his identity to the test and Odysseus is quite frustrated by this. And this, I think, um, Professor is one of the, if not the, most well-known scene in, in the Odyssey. So if you could read from the translation. He went from his bath looking like a god, sitting again on the chair from which he'd risen opposite his wife. He spoke to her and said, strange woman, the gods have made your heart harder than that of any female. No other wife could so cruelly keep her distance from a husband who, after so much suffering 20 years on, had reached his native land. And he turns to Eurycleia, but come, mama, make my bed so I can sleep alone, for her heart within is iron. Wise Penelope answered him and said, strange man, I'm not proud, I do not scorn you, nor am I amazed, well knowing what you look like when you left Ithaca in your ship. But Eurycleia, prepare his bed outside the well-made bedroom that he built himself. Move the bed out there and make it up with a caross and rugs and shining blankets. Yes, this is a wonderful scene. It's the most complex of the recognition scenes. And it's fascinating. I mean, I actually never thought of this before, but just reading it, notice that Odysseus says to Penelope, any other wife would not have kept a distance. But 
of course, that's what Athena had said to him earlier. No husband would keep away from his house and family on his return home. So Penelope really is a counterpart to Odysseus. She's as cunning and as and as careful and rightly so in recognizing this blood stain even after he's had a bath. She's still suspicious. Who is this man? Clearly 20 years older. She knows what Odysseus looked like when he went to Troy. And of course, this gives rise to, she mentions moving the bed, and that is the sign to Odysseus. Well, Odysseus is fooled because he knows that the bed that he had built before he left was made around a living olive tree and couldn't possibly be moved. So the, the man who's tested and tried and lied to every person that he's encountered is now finally fooled by someone even more cunning than him, namely his wife. That, that's what leads to the final recognition. Yes. Um, so let's let's now get to our penultimate question. What do you think about the suitors in this story? Are they the villains of the story? They are clearly hateful to Odysseus and his household, and their behavior in loitering and destroying another man's house and property is clearly wrong and offensive to the gods. But Homer, in keeping himself out of the story as a kind of impartial narrator, provides them with speeches on their own behalf. But as we've already said, once Odysseus starts slaying them or wreaking his revenge, he does it in an almost indiscriminate manner. For him, there's no point in distinguishing between them. A suitor is a suitor, and he kills them all. So what are we to make of these kind of mixed motivations? Some suitors might have wanted to marry Penelope because of her beauty, but others might be might have been purely interested in marrying her such that they could become the king of Ithaca. Are we supposed to pay any attention to these mixed motivations, or is it all the same to us as is for Odysseus? To come to the first part of your question, yes, undoubtedly, the suitors are the villains of the piece. It's interesting that, you know, unusually for characters in Homer, the suitors have got mainly negative fixed epithets. You know, most heroes in Homer have got fixed epithets that are repeated with their name as an oral formula over and over again. For example, Odysseus and Achilles and others are godlike, wise, noble, shining lord of men and so on. Whereas the suitors uniquely really among human characters, their fixed epithets are negative. To come to that other question about should we discriminate? I don't think so. And, you know, it's because the way the suitors are depicted is shaped by the kind of story that Homer chooses to tell in the Odyssey, which, as you've said, is a, essentially a vengeance plot. In many respects, I mean, you can see how it's the direct ancestor of the later Western, you know, a woman, a family isolated on the homestead, the man away for whatever reason, the family are besieged, the cowboy comes home and and kills all the enemies. And that kind of revenge plot, I think, demands a certain simplification. We, we need to know who's good and who's bad. I mean, think of these recent Tarantino movies. Everyone's wiped out at the end. It's, you know, it's not, it's not a realistic mode, really. It's a kind of fantasy of total satisfaction, total revenge. And it's the same with the suitors, because it's that kind of plot. We, we don't really expect uh, them to be subtle discriminations, to be made. And yet, that said, there is, the poet clearly does feel that something should be suggested, that some of them might be different. There is one sympathetic suitor, Amphinomus, whom Odysseus, as the beggar, explicitly warns. He delivers a famous speech to him about the instability and changeability of human fortune and says, you know, that being the case, we should be careful, honor the gods and try to do the right thing. And Amphinomus hears what he's saying and it says, sort of shakes his head and goes away sadly, but he still throws in his lot with the suitors, and so he's killed along with the rest of them. So there, there is a little discrimination at that point, but because of the kind of plot, I think you know the suitors are pretty much died in the wool villains. Professor, I would like to end the podcast on a more personal note by asking you what your favorite piece of literature is and why, perhaps besides the Odyssey and the Iliad, and then what your hopes are for the future of a humanities education is at South African universities more broadly. I hope you weren't going to ask that question. It's so difficult. And I, I kind of, I, I never like these things that you see online, lists of you know, the five best, the 10 best, in particular with literature, where it's so enormously diverse and 
and rich. And, you know, my advice or my view is you either like literature or you don't. I mean, either you love reading, you want to read, you know, no telling you these are the great books could guide you and help you if you are already a reader. But you, you have to just indiscriminately like literature. I mean, hours and hours of my days, months probably add up all the time of my life being spent in secondhand bookshops just looking for interesting reading. If if I narrow it down, one of my favorite areas of modern literature is modernism, that period between about, you know, just before the First World War up until the end of the 1920s, where you get this massive experimentation in all the arts, including literature. It's a time of Ford, Maddox, Ford, Ezra Pound, T.S. Eliot, Wyndham Lewis, and of course, James Joyce. And if I'm forced to clump for one work I really do love and keep returning to, that's James Joyce's Ulysses. The other part of your question, the hopes for the humanities, where I see the future of the humanities at South African universities. I think one can't be too sort of idealistic about this sort of thing. You know, if you think about universities, when they originated in Europe, the modern university, just about a thousand years ago now, they were essentially places, institutions of professional training. I mean, the only things you could study at the university with theology, which was essentially vital for your practical life. If you wanted to get on in public life, you needed to take take orders, whether you became a priest or not, or law or medicine. So the idea of studying the humanities is really quite a modern thing, which only arises in the 19th century. So it's kind of a contingent matter. So arts and social sciences are, are very late additions to the university. I've And, you know, I, I wouldn't be too pessimistic because the threat to the humanities is a kind of theme that's been sounded by uh, people almost for as long as the humanities have been part of the university. Certainly in my discipline of classics, we're so used to it. We've, like Odysseus, learned to be cunning, to adapt, to endure, to <laughs> be flexible. We have survived by those means. So you know, I don't see any reason to think the humanities Humanities won't continue to exist and thrive in South Africa, perhaps in a different form. Obviously, now that the you know universities are not only for a minority in South Africa, but a representative sample of the of the whole population content of the humanities obviously will change. There'll be more emphasis on indigenous South African literature, whether in English or in any of the African uh, African languages in Afrikaans. But so I think that's inevitable. But I would hope that where the humanities are studied, an international outlook still prevails because, you know, one, one can't really appreciate what one has oneself in one's own c- country unless you know what other people have done. It makes you more aware to, to know what they've done in Ireland or in England or in France or Germany or America or China or wherever. It makes you far more appreciative and helps you to understand your own culture more deeply. And that's, I hope, the direction that the humanities will take when it survives in the future. That is a wonderful sentiment to end on. And seeing as you've mentioned T.S. Eliot, I think we should conclude with a few words from T.S. Eliot's Four Quartets. And what there is to conquer by strength and submission has already been discovered once or twice or several times by men whom one cannot hope to emulate. But there is no competition. There is only the fight to recover what has been lost and found and lost again and again. And now, under conditions that seem unpropitious, but perhaps neither gain nor loss. For us, there is only the trying. The rest is not our business. Professor, thank you so much for trying with me today. As I say, the rest is not our business, but that is unfortunately all we have time for today on the Great Conversation podcast. Thank you for sharing some of your valuable time and expertise with us. To our listeners and viewers at home, please remember to subscribe to the podcast and do not forget to share it with friends and family who may have a potential interest in great literature. Also tune into next week's episode when we will be discussing Virgil's Aeneid. Professor, thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you for being such a good interlocutor.